So let's get started. We're recording today's lecture. We're going to continue on with our neonate. Uh, we'll be in neonates for today and then also for the week when you come back from uh, spring break. Uh, and then the following week, you will have your exam. So we'll do our best to uh, get your uh, study guide out to you later later today. So when these kids are born, especially if they're a premature, and a premature is basically classified as what? what? At what gestational age would we say, oh, this is a premature delivery? Under 36. Under what? Under 36 weeks. Under 36 weeks. So, yeah, it literally is. I mean, because we're looking at those, those 36 weeks. Uh, being kind of the defining line, the normal gestational period for a for a for a baby is what? How many weeks? Forty, 40 weeks. Okay, so that last month there's not a huge amount of development that will continue to take place. Now, depending upon how early the baby is, will also affect its weight. All right. So the earlier the baby is born, as far as prematurity the less that they'll weigh. They can be as small as uh, one and a half up to five pounds, uh, which basically translates into somewhere around uh, a half to two kilograms. The big issue that you got to remember with these babies that are born is the fact that when they come out, they are going to have some respiratory issues. And that much like we've talked about with all of our premature patients, that's the area in which we got to face or that, that, that we've got to address in taking care of them. If your kid comes out and they weigh four pounds or, or more, they have a relatively good chance of surviving. Anything less than that, now we're going to be much more concerned about them not surviving. The other thing to keep in mind with these kids, something else rises up even higher than what we would normally want to do for these kids, and that is what? What is one critical thing? Keep them warm, okay? Okay. Keep them warm. Again, if they are born really, really premature, they are not going to have any fat for that matter. Brown, yellow, or polka dot. It's just not going to be there. So they're not going to have any insulation that's going on, as well as their ability to generate heat is going to be severely reduced. Again, with these kids, the ideal thing would be as if we can make skin-to-skin -skin contact with them, here's the problem with that. Because these kids suffer so much from respiratory problems, you're going to be busy taking care of the ABCs of this child. Again, this is definitely one of those situations, unlike I told you with a normal delivery, where you really don't need backup, you really don't need to transport emergency into the hospital, Definitely, you're going to need some backup here with this one because if the child is born prematurely, mom will also have, generally, I have some uh, 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 physiological problems with potentially with bleeding. But most definitely, she's going to have some emotional problems because she's going to be worried about her, uh, her, her, uh, her, her, her child. Generally, what we're looking at at about 22 to 23 weeks gestation, if a child is born prior to that, the ability of the child to survive is almost nothing. Not always, but generally what we will see is that, especially if it is a pre-hospital delivery, the child generally will not survive for the next 24 hours. Many times, if it's a delivery done in the hospital, the child does have a really good chance of survival because they're already there for advanced care for for the, the an event, advanced neonatal ICU. Now, let me ask you a question. Those of you that have been doing your clinic, let me, have you started your hospital clinicals? Okay, good. I'm glad to see see you nodding your heads. Anybody been to OB yet? Okay. Have you seen a delivery or anything along that line? Okay. So here's the thing I want to stress to you, okay? 
OB nurses are fiercely protective of both their patients. Trust me, you're not going to get to do a delivery, okay? If you get to go in and see a delivery, that means that the nurses really like you, okay? And they trust you. Make sure, make sure that you are documenting every single pediatric contact you have because unlike adults where we can come in towards the end of the of the summer and we can simulate those if you come up and let's say you're short on i don't know chest pain this is kentucky you shouldn't be short on chest pains but with kids we can't simulate that based on our accreditation rules so you have to literally find and assess all those ages of kids so be very very particular and meticulous on your documentation of all those kids that you have any kind of contact with and by assessing basically i mean i think you said you you've done ob how many shifts have you done in ob just one, just one. uh have you come into contact to see or be around any of the kids uh, they took the time the nursery. okay when you go into the nursery what i mean by assessing and again sometimes especially if the, the child is not stable, they're not going to let you touch them. But you can do a mental assessment of the child. You know, you can you can document, okay, this is what I saw as far as the patient's respiratory status, its cardiac status, what was going on. So even though you're not physically touching the baby, that you're physically not touching or, or assessing, Please, 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 okay? I want to keep what little hair I got left. I don't want to pull it out at the end of the semester trying to find children for you to assess because we can't make it up and we can't simulate it. Make sure that you're documenting all these that you come into contact with, okay? Everybody hear that? That's, out of everything I'm going to say this morning, that's the most important thing. Now you can go back to sleep, okay? All right. Now, when... Premies are born, they're at huge increase for, we've talked about respiratory issues, hypothermia issues. Here's the other thing. All premature babies get a blood glucose. That doesn't necessarily mean that, Allie, you're going to give them glucose if it's low, but it establishes a baseline. Because, again, these kids will be going through energy like crazy because up until they were born, they were totally dependent upon mom for warmth, for oxygen, and for nourishment. Now that lifeline Thomas is being cut, now the baby is dependent upon itself. So find out that blood sugar as soon as you possibly can. Now they're also at risk for bleeding in the heart, okay? So the heart is not yet developed. And the heart is now having to push against the, the baby's uh, afterload in order to get blood going through the, through the body. So it is possible that the baby could be having some internal bleeding from the cardiac stance. Kira? Uh, what's a normal blood glucose? Normal blood glucose for a baby is the same as what we're looking at for any adult. Basically, what we want it to be is above 60, okay? We would like to see the blood glucose up closer to 80, but if you've got a 60 on a preemie, you go, oh man, that's great. I love to see that. All right. Good. Uh, what would we do if the baby is hypoglycemic? So basically, here's the thing. On a premature child, your only IV access is basically going to be an IO, and that's going to be challenging. Again, full disclosure, I've never done an IO on a premium. I've done several on infants that have, have gone into cardiac arrest. Now think about this a minute. Do we want to give D50, I'm sorry, D10, D25, probably D10 would be the more appropriate drug. Do we want to give that IO based on what you know about the effects of concentrated glucose? Why not? 
kill the cells. Yeah, so it will destroy the marrow, and it could potentially cause some damage to the internal structure of the bone, leading into problems later on as that child begins to grow. So in answer to your question, it's we're not going to do anything. We're going to provide rapid, safe transport to the hospital. But we've got that baseline now of showing this is what happened right after the child was born. Now, don't try to get a glucose until you have dried, warmed, and addressed cardiovascular and respiratory issues that you would come into contact with. Thank you all. I am so glad to have my class back on Wednesday. I don't know where y'all were on Monday. So this is awesome. So, again, when we're looking at this, keep in mind that when these kids are born premature, they come looking, come out looking like little old men and little old women. Their skin is very translucent. Basically, you can almost kind of see through their skin, Joe, and, and see some of the vasculature that is underneath it. The same thing can happen as patients age and skin begins to thin as well. It becomes very, very thin, and now those older patients are at a greater risk for uh, skin tears, all right? And so that's the big thing that we want to want to keep in mind. That translucent skin also functions, let me back up, the skin also functions as a method of, number one, protection as far as outside bacteria or virus, and number two, also to help preserve heat in the body. If we can see through that, that tells us the skin is not thick enough, and therefore the patient is now going to begin running uh, a risk of, of hypothermia. With these kids, generally we will see their extremities will be shorter than what would be normal, okay? Especially if they're born really, really early. And so arms and legs will generally be, be, be shorter. Activity will be less. Often, much less. Why? Why Why would you expect a full-term child to come out <laughs> kicking and screaming, but a premature, not so much? Let me go over here to the corner to crash. I think we got a new nickname. Go ahead, Yusef. Okay, so he hit upon two of them. Allie, what else? He, he said mental or motor development. What else do they not have? Primarily two more things that we already, we've actually already talked about. Any guesses? I was going to say muscle development. Okay, all right. Great minds think alike. Um, Bell, you had your hand up. Okay, remember, what does it take to move muscles? And what does it take to make energy and and oxygen? Okay, so those are the four reasons why when these these babies come out, they're really really lethargic. They're not going to move around. From a physical perspective, the brain's not developed, the motor system is not developed. Even if it were, they don't have adequate stores of uh, glucose. Excuse me, and they're not going to be able to. Uh, to process oxygen. Now you're thinking, well, if I got a ventilatory problem, Bill, let me just put them on to positive pressure ventilation. What's the problem with that? It's a solution, but what's the problem with that? Mark? You have to be really careful because they're on maybe very small and weak. Yeah. Remember, skin is thin, so are the lungs. And so we want to be really, really careful that we don't overventilate our patient, which means we're going to have to do what on a regular basis while we're ventilating? Say it again. Listen to the lung sounds. Allie. I was just going to say that also they have a lack of why, do we, why are we concerned about surfactant? That's a good answer that I hadn't even thought or I hadn't got to in my notes here, but I'm glad you brought it up. Why is surfactant so very important? 
Nut burst. So what happened? Collapse. Yeah. So keep in mind, surfactant is produced within the lungs. And one of the reasons that surfactant is so very important is it reduces, I'll come right to you, Richard. It reduces the surface tension of the alveoli. The alveoli, if they don't have surfactant, they'll have a tendency to do this. Think about if you've ever taken two pieces of flat glass and put just a little bit of fluid between them and put them together. In many situations, that glass will break before you can pull them apart. You have to slide one off of the other in order to get them apart. Similar thing happens within the alveoli that they will collapse. And what doesn't happen when they collapse? No gas exchange, no oxygen in, no carbon dioxide over and out. What's the medical term for that collapse? Atelectasis, atelectasis. Keep in mind that we can see patients with atelectasis at all ages, especially older patients who develop pneumonia. Richard. I would also say, especially if they're premature, the odds of having a mask that would actually fit them is lower, too. Definitely. Okay. So we would have, you know, obviously you're required to carry uh, an infant mask on your ambulance. But again, if the child is premature, they're going to be much smaller than what that infant mask is going to do. Okay. Expert tip. This may work for you. I've had to do it a couple of times. It's worked for me. On a premature child, if the mask that you have is too large, take it and reverse it. Okay? So basically what the, normally, mask kind of goes like this, nose piece and mouthpiece down here. If you reverse it, especially for a premature, here's what happens is that the nose piece goes down here and the chin piece comes up here on the forehead. Now, what happens is we're going to be ventilating the whole face, all right? And so in that situation, that may do exactly what Richard shared with us and a good observation as well of being able to alleviate that. Now, that solution raises a problem. What is it? What's the problem if you have to do that for a preemie? Pressure on the eyes? Not pressure on the eyes, because generally it's going to go around the eyes. It definitely has to do with the eyes, though. So that's one thing. That oxygen is going to dry them out. So if you can utilize humidified oxygen, try to do that. Excellent answer. There's another problem that's even more critical that can lead to blindness. Okay, that's all right. High levels of concentration directed at the eyes of a newborn can often be detrimental. It can often cause structural damage. Now, again, this is one of those situations, John, where Bill's number one rule comes into play. And that rule is what? Tree what's going to kill your patient first. You got a preemie here. They're not breathing. Cardiovascular wise, they're not doing well. We've got to address the respiratory issue. There is a possibility that the high flow oxygen can cause some problems with their sight. The key words there are can cause. We're not assured of that. But if we don't have good ventilatory support for the preemie, doesn't really matter what their eyes are going to be because the child will die. Okay, so again, that's one of those situations where you treat what's going to kill them first. And again, watch your pressure from your ventilations, okay? This is even more important when you're ventilating a premature child is to only use the back half of the bag. We should be only doing that for all patients, adults and children, because having the full bag squeezed is just too much air. Now let's do a little bit of a, a physiology review. What actually happens when we 
overventilate a patient of any age? What detrimental things happen? It can cause tears in the alveoli. It can cause tears in the alveoli more so for infants than it would be for adults. Barrel trauma for from, from the use of a BVM, even for using it by squeezing the whole bag, are rare. We can see some micro tears for older patients that maybe have COPD, primarily emphysema, but that's generally not going to be where our biggest problems are going to come from. Yusuf. What happens with pressure on the vena cava? And when we reduce preload, we reduce what? We reduce cardiac output. Claire. Can you also tell us acidosis? Acidosis? How? Well, it So with, okay. The answer to your question is it depends. If you are doing a correct rate, but your tidal volume is too heavy, too too large, too too much, potentially it could do that because again, coming back to what Yusef said, is that we reduce preload, which reduces cardiac output, which means the blood stays in the body longer, which could potentially bring up our our uh, CO two. But most of the time, what happens is that when we are providing too much tidal volume, we're also providing too much as far as rate. Now, we can begin blowing off CO2, which causes what big, big problem, especially in your head injury patients, going back to trauma last semester. Thomas. It can cause nitrogen washout. When we wash out nitrogen, Thomas, what bad thing happens? Vasodilation. Okay. So, so does it cause dilation or constriction? Because remember, nitrogen is a part of nitroglycerin. So when you give nitroglycerin, say it again, it causes constriction. Allie. It's going to increase ICP. Why? Yes. Tell me more. Yeah. So we're going to cause vasoconstriction, which means your afterload is going to go up. So your pressure is going to go up. Perfusion is going to go down also. So again, y'all are going to be the poster children for adequate ventilation by squeezing the back half of the bag first and letting your rate and death be guided by what two things? Thomas? Those two things right there. Those two things right there. Awesome. Pre-hospital care for a premature is the same as we would have for any newborn, except more and more intense. Again, we have to take special care to make sure that we are maintaining the body temp of the child. So don't be afraid to, especially for, for a premature, to, okay, I'm joking here when I say shrink wrap, so don't shrink it. But if you've got plastic, you can utilize that plastic to help insulate the child as long as you put a covering, some type of a bulky covering over it, like a blanket, okay? A towel works really, really well for, for premature uh, babies because it's more size appropriate. The, uh, the, the plastic wrap will help to conserve the body heat, and then the towel acts as just another type of, uh, of insulation. Keep in mind that especially premature kids are almost always going to be born with little to no air. So they're going to kind of look like me. I do now. Believe it or not, I used to have hair and it used to be black, Sam. But they're, they're going to lose a lot of heat from the top of their skull. One of the things that you can do to help minimize that is to put a washcloth on the top of their head and wrap gauze or cling or adhesive uh, adhering dressing around the baby's head 
to hold that in place. Make sure when you do your handoff to the hospital that the hospital understands, Thomas, that there's no trauma here. That's just a skull cap to keep the, to keep the baby warm. Generally, what we're looking at is we're targeting a temp, a body temp of about 100 degrees, okay? All ambulances, whether you're required to or not, but all ambulances should be carrying some type of an infrared thermometer. Use the infrared thermometer to gauge the body temp of your, of your child, okay? Now, Make sure you know where the specialized facilities uh, are for premature children that are in your area. Understand, just like with trauma centers that you can have from one to four, as far as levels, with a four being the lowest, you can also have neonatal ICUs that are ranked similarly. Okay, so you want to transport your child to the nearest appropriate a neonatal facility for the uh, for the for that particular child. So, for, in order to do that, you got to know where they are and what their capabilities are. I would encourage you. Y'all are going to be leading ambulance services in just a very short period of time after you graduate. Reach out to these hospitals and build relationships with them so that you can send the folks that you are going to be either supervising or directing periodically in there for after licensure rotations. Because again, remember, we don't deal with kids a whole lot. That's a good thing on our part. When we do deal with kids, they are usually really, really sick. That's a bad thing on our part. So to reduce your stress and to provide better care for the child, make sure that you are getting continuing education at least every couple of years by being exposed to some of these of these kids. Most of the time, we're going to be targeted in on simply providing good airway support, good ventilation for the children, because again, these preemies are almost always issues of breathing and airway issues. And that's going to keep you, that's going to keep you really, really busy, even though you still have um, have your partner. And that's another reason why you're going to want to have your uh, backup going going on the way there. When you're dealing with a woman that is in labor, one of the first things you want to do is you want to begin the assessment of, if you feel like you're going to do a delivery, Joe, you want to begin that assessment even before the child is born. Now, what are some risks that you would want to find out what are some things that would put a neonate at risk of being born early or with a problem that could cause some major issues? Yusef. Say it again. Yes, if it's, you say if they're premature. Oh, breach, I'm sorry. I'm having a terrible time hearing today. I know it's not your guy's fault. If they are breech, how would you know that? So if mom tells you, ah, this child is, uh, my, 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 they tell me my baby is breech, I'm supposed to go in next week to be induced and for them to try to turn the child around. We'll get into this a little bit deeper when we talk about births. I'll come right to you, Allie. What should be your primary goal in a in a, a, a lady that knows that her baby is breech position? What are you going to do that will best be in the best interest of both baby and mom in a breech position like that? Rapid transport. Rapid transport. Diesel drip. Okay, rapid but safe transport. Okay, one of the things, and we'll we'll talk more about this when we get into OB emergencies, is knowing the likelihood of a delivery or not. And we'll talk uh, again. We'll get deeper into this, but understand if this is the is mom's first baby, chances are like 
85 to 90 percent high that you're not going to deliver that okay so if it's a breach breach uh presentation that's a good thing for us Allie, hadn't forgotten about you So we need to know how far along the baby is, okay? What does this presuppose? This is one of a big one that we're seeing more and more frequently. What does this presuppose? Both of y'all gave good good uh, good items, a breach and the gestational period. But what does this assume on the part of mom? And along with that knowing, what's the other part? We see more and more people that are not, for whatever reason, able to get prenatal care. Okay, They choose not to or they're not able to afford it. So understand what I'm going to say now. This is not a political statement, okay? As our country progresses and we have more people coming into the country of various nationalities, one of the things that you have to remember is your health care provider, first and foremost. When you're looking at a patient in front of you, this is harder for some patients than others. You've got to provide that person the same level of care, Claire, that you would provide to your mom, to your dad, to your siblings, regardless of who they are or whether or not, I'm choosing my words carefully here, whether or not they're supposed to be here or whether or not whatever they've done. Now, I will tell you, when you're dealing with child abuse, and we'll talk more about child abuse later, that is the hardest thing for me to do, is to look at a child abuser who may need medical care from me after I've seen what most of the time they are he's that have have done this abuse. But again, if nothing else, if, if from no other reason than protecting yourself legally, take care of all of your patients. And again, what does this have to do with, with the lecture today is understand that a lot of women, for whatever reason, many times they have drug problems and they're afraid. Okay, if I go ahead and get prenatal care, the first thing you're going to do is they're going to want to know what drugs I'm on. Then do I go to jail or do they shut my drugs off? Many times women just don't get prenatal care take care of them and the baby. Now I'll step back down off of my, my soapbox. What else? What else would put a neonate at risk of having a problem? Eclampsia. eclampsia. What is eclampsia, Claire? And what do we not do when we're having seizures? Yeah, very good. That's a good answer. So if mom's not breathing, guess who else isn't breathing? Junior. Okay? The baby is not getting oxygen. Saw a hand over here again. What? One more. Allie. Absolutely. Now, in many situations, mom's not going to be aware of that until the actual delivery. We'll talk about some things that you will have to do in order to do that. These are good, good things to, to look at. So again, be thinking like a master chess player. Don't leave Thomas, I promise I'll get better, man. As, as, as people that play chess, I, I've never learned the game of chess, I don't understand it, but when I talk to people, they say, well, I, I, I'm good at this because I can think anywhere from five to seven moves ahead. Do the exact same thing as a healthcare provider. Be thinking. Kira, if I do this, I'm hoping this happens. But if this happens over here, then this is going to be what my next move is going to be. That's where you become a clinician and not just a technician of saying, oh, well, I'm just going to defibrillate. Well, why are you going to do that? What are you going to do if it doesn't work? Know in advance where you're going to take your child. Okay, Know in advance where that child is going to go and what 
what arrangements you need to make. Now understand, EMS is incredibly busy today. You may request backup and you may not get it, okay, because all trucks may be busy. Understand that. So the big thing you need to do is to know what you're going to do and how to involve others with you. Okay, this may be a situation where you pull a firefighter. If you get a fire department response off of the scene, put them in the back with you and, and you, you do a really, really quick OBGYN lesson for them of what they need to do. If you don't have a fire response, this may be a situation where you bring in a family member and you do the exact same thing. Get another set of hands back there. That will help you. The other thing, and then I'm going to move off of the delivery process, is remember I said that there's rarely a never or an always in medicine, but this is an absolute never. Never try to deliver a baby in the back of a moving truck. Okay, Babies come out, for lack of a better description, slick as snot. They are slippery. You're wearing uh, latex-free gloves. Mucus and latex-free gloves do not work very well, okay? Your partner has to stop. They have to swerve. The baby comes out of your hand. And now you're having to explain to a court of law why you are in the back of a moving ambulance. Stop. Find a safe place in a parking lot. Try not to do it on the side of a road, but try to find a safe place. Do the delivery, and then once the delivery is over, going into the hospital. We'll talk more about that when we talk about OBs. Generally, what we see at the time of birth is that we see some really, really important physiological changes that occur. One of the first things that happens is that as the baby descends down into the birth canal and it passes through the pelvic opening, the lungs are squeezed and then as it comes through the pelvic, uh, the bottom part of the pelvic ring, they expand back out. Two things happen in that situation. Number one, the fluid that is in the baby's lungs, the excess fluid now gets expelled. The fluid that is left in there now becomes the basis for something that Allie brought up earlier. What is that? Surfactant. Surfactant, okay? Second thing that happens is that the increased pressure in the lungs triggers the barrel receptors in the brain. And it is at this point, John, under a normal delivery, that compression and expansion, the increase in pressure and then the release, that through the birthing process is being sent to the baby's brain that, okay, kid, you're, you're responsible for your own breathing now. And that is what is going to cause the baby to breathe. Don't be surprised as the baby's head is born, as it comes out, that the baby starts crying right away. That's an awesome sound, by the way, okay? I like to say a crying baby is a happy paramedic, okay? And so suction the baby's mouth and the nose as it is as that is coming out. So the baby will now begin to breathe on its own. Second thing that happens is part of that increased pressure is that we have a change in the circulatory system that now begins that uh, uh, impulse of the baby now beginning to do more of its own perfusionary status. Now, keep in mind, again, like we talked about in here, kids decompensate really, really quickly because of what? Especially newborns. They decompensate during shock because of what? They're dependent upon the heart rate. They do not have good vasoconstriction uh, ability until they get older, okay? So that heart rate now begins to increase. Third thing is that the, the baby's body signals to itself that now I'm responsible for keeping my own body warm. And we're going to help that. We're going to help that by kicking the heat up in the back of the ambulance and by bundling the child up. Remember, baby has been in mom. 
been in a comfort controlled environment that is perfect for the baby. Bathed in amniotic fluid, which is warm. Getting blood from mom, which is warm. And now what is happening is that it begins to go through and the child now begins to take care of all those uh, uh, those processes. I think Allie alluded to this a little bit earlier when she was talking about the cord around the neck. Understand that if you have a prolapsed cord, we don't want that to happen. Now, we'll talk more about how to deal with that in just a little bit, but what is a prolapsed cord? Think back to your EMT course. If you have a prolapsed cord, Yusef, what do we have? Why is that a problem? So you're exactly right. Understand, during the birthing process, the baby is making that transition over to maintain its, its own perfusionary and ventilatory status on its own. The key word there is, Thomas, transition. Still has somewhat dependent upon the mom. If the baby comes out and the cord comes out first, remember, the baby's head will now engage with that cord and will compress that cord, not so much against the vaginal wall. The vaginal wall is very, very pliable tissue. That's a good thing because there are certain situations in which it's going to be life-saving for you to be able to insert your fingers into the vaginal canal to save the baby. But where the compression does begin to occur is back farther up where the pelvic ring is. So the head comes down and puts pressure on the umbilical cord against the pelvic girdle, cuts off that blood supply. And again, if the, if that, especially if you've got a, a child whose head gets stuck, see this quite often in kids that are born to moms who are gestational diabetics. Large body, large head, cannot engage as far as being born vaginally, have to be born via C-section, but the head becomes stuck right there at the lower part of the pelvic girdle. If you got a prolapsed cord, now we have no circulation going to the baby, and the baby can now begin to, to suffer. Also understand that during the birth process, this whole process uh, begins to release adrenaline in the baby, and it activates the sodium channels, especially within the heart, which makes the heart much more efficient, okay? Now, the nice thing about that increased heart rate during the ventilatory status, or the, the, during the, the delivery status, the, the impact that it has on the baby's ventilations is what? Think about this. Baby's being born. Adrenaline is being released. Sympathetic nervous system is engaged. What does that do to help improve the anatomy and physiology of the baby's breathing ability? Yusef. Which results in what? So we have more oxygen that's going to be delivered more CO2 that's being taken away. What other mechanical thing happens? I kind of referred to this a while ago when we were talking about the chest being compressed and surfactant be, or, uh, uh, fluids in the lung being expelled. What else happens, Allie? Yeah, remember, that's one of the processes that we want to see these babies crying is that in that crying process, they're going to get more and more fluid out of the lungs so that we can have that diffusionary status that will be will be improved. And so again, the increased adrenaline leads into this and it works much better. Also, when the sodium levels go up as the baby's being born, what else happens, Allie? And it causes the extra fluid that can be pushed out to be absorbed in the 
I love smart people. Y'all are awesome. Yeah, you're exactly right. So that fluid now begins to be absorbed. Why is that good for the baby? Two reasons. Why is it good for the baby? As a result of what? You're on the right track. So we have less pulmonary edema in the lungs. That's one good thing. What's another good reason? Why is that a good thing? Indirectly, Yusuf. Say it again. They're starting to do everything on their own. Now. They're starting to do everything on their own, and in particular, related to this, this helps reduce the possibility of dehydration. Because remember, fluid shifts in newborns are dramatic. Okay, and so when this fluid stays within the body, the baby becomes much more hydrated, and now they begin to uh, to 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 uh, to be able to maintain their own fluid balance. Again, keep in mind that the other thing that comes into play that helps to stimulate the baby to breathe is, first of all, not just the compression of the lungs, but the dramatic change in body temp. Think about this. Have you ever stepped into a shower thinking that it was a nice, warm shower, but instead it was an ice-cold shower? What did you involuntarily do? Yeah. And what did that do? It brings more air into the lungs. Years ago, my first trip to, to, to Europe, my, my wife and I went over and we, we did some church work in Romania. This was just after communism had fallen. And so our church denomination was asking for people to come over and teach their leaders how to work with their, their youth. So we went over and spent about 10 days, two weeks there in Romania. Awesome country. Wonderful people. And then we came out and we spent about another week in Germany. So we were camping. And they had showers. And you went in and you paid for your shower. And I'm in there all showering up and thinking, well, I wonder what happens when my time is up, does the water shut off? Does it slowly now begin to get cold or whatever? Well, I didn't have long to find out. The water did not shut off, but it literally went from nice and toasty warm to like 25 degrees. I mean, it it felt like icicles. And I can remember to this day of uh, that whole, oh, it's cold. Okay, I'm done. We're finished. Or I'm going to put more coins into the into the, to the receptacle. And so the baby does the exact same thing. Keep in mind, inside mom's body is about 98, 99 degrees, especially internal. It's delivered out here that even if it is like 90 degrees, which would be very warm for us in here, that's still a big, big temperature change in the baby. So that change in body temperature also causes the baby now to begin to go in and to breathe on itself. As the pressure in the body begins to increase, because remember, mom has done, for the most part, the baby's had a heartbeat, but the mom has done the most part as far as circulating blood around through the baby. There's a small part of the baby's heart called the foramen ovale. Foramen ovale. What is that? What 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 is the purpose of the foramen ovale? Nobody read their material. Commonly known as a hole in the heart. Quite often, you will hear parents say, "My baby was born with a hole in the heart, and they got to go in and surgically fix it." Well, they're only partially right. All babies are born with a hole in their heart. That's called the foramen ovale. And it, it allows the blood to literally move from the left ventricle over into the right ventricle. Why is that important for normal delivery or normal development of a baby? Think about the anatomy and physiology of what happens when the baby is developing, 
how does it get its oxygen? Allie? Gets it from mom. Why doesn't the baby's blood go through the atria then? Because it really doesn't. It simply moves from left ventricle, I mean right ventricle to left ventricle. Allie? They don't, they're not pressure like circulation. It circulates through the heart. That's part of it. Okay, so again... Mom is oxygenating the blood for the child. They're not really in charge of that. But here's the other thing. If we had that had blood that went directly from the right ventricle or right atrium into the right ventricle and we had direct passageway uh, under normal circumstances, where, where's your blood go right now from the right ventricle? Into the lungs. Why will that not work for a baby that's being developed? Lungs aren't, aren't functioning. They're full of fluid, okay? So that foraminal valley allows oxygenated blood to move directly over into the left ventricle to now to go out to the baby. When the baby is born, that begins to close up, and usually it is completely occluded and closed up, Within 24 hours. It really amazes me as to how the body is designed that, that the, the body recognizes that and now, now does that. When parents have children that they say, well, my baby is born with a hole in their heart and they got to go in and close it up. That foramen or valley, for whatever reason, doesn't close. There's several reasons why it wouldn't close. Number one, prematurity is one. Okay. The pressure that increases in the heart helps to close off that foramen ovale. That's another reason why when babies are born, they come out looking like little smurfs. They'll look as blue as your jacket, Allie. Okay? Don't let that freak you out. That's normal. If they're not pinking up in about five minutes, now you can start getting freaked out. Okay? So it's all that part of that process of changing, increasing oxygenation in the blood. The other thing that comes into play here is if the child is born with a low blood pressure, because it's that blood pressure in the heart that triggers the heart itself to do self-surgery and to begin to close that off. Understand that when your child is born, again, are you concerned about the O2 sat of this baby? Why, Sam? All right, Mark. Why? You're right. Tell me Tell me why you should be. Well, yeah, O2 sat is important, okay? Now, remember, if we do an O2 sat on you, Ahmad, what do we need to remember about, if it reads 94%, when did that 94% happen? Yeah, anywhere from three to five minutes ago, depending upon the patient. Understand that if the baby is born and they come out and you immediately put O2 set on them, it may read in the high 80s, low 90s, and it may stay there for up to 10 minutes. How do we know then that our baby is getting adequate oxygenation? Skin. That's where we start. Okay. Remember. We start out with a nice kind of blue-looking child, and it converts over into a pink. What else? Skin is one. Bella? End title would be one. Now, I would tell you, you don't really need to put end title on a normal birth. Most definitely, if you can make it fit... End title would be a good thing to put on a preemie. So we will begin to see that change. And the nice thing about end title we know is that unlike SPO2, which tells us what happened three to five minutes ago, end title tells us what happened within the last 10 seconds. John. Crying. Crying okay. Crying requires what in order to do? And, okay, he said air. What else does it require? Energy, air, 
and energy, okay? Both of which are good indicators of what? Oxygenation and the availability of glucose for, for the child, okay? So the more the baby cries, the better off it is. Richard? Also requires a certain level of cognitive function. It does require a certain level of cognitive functioning that is fed more by the, I would tell you, the subconscious nerve or the subconscious brain rather than the conscious brain because the conscious brain is not yet developed in the, in the baby. But yes, you are exactly right. So these are all things that we would begin to look at. What would be the other thing, especially with neonates, that we would want to assess to tell us about the the uh, ventilatory status of our, of our child? One of the most important ones that you've forgotten. Yet, yeah, it should be one of the ones that writes up there at the top. Activity is good. I put that in the same area as we would with, uh, say, crying. Allie. Lung sounds. Lung sounds. They're pretty good, but I will tell you, you'll hear lots and lots of crackles in, in, the, in the newborn because they're still getting rid of that fluid. You know? Their heart rate. Okay, their heart rate. Remember, the primary cause of cardiac issues in pediatrics is respiratory problems and we want to be able to look at those and address them okay babies newborns are really really sensitive to two things temperature and hypoxia okay so serious brain injury can come about if we're not really really uh, aggressive in taking care of these some of the more common ones that we would see is number one Compression of a prolapsed cord that we've talked about. Maternal drug use. Remember, when mom takes in either amphetamines, if she's using crack cocaine, excuse me, or if she is taking in some type of a narcotic, next stop for that drug is the baby as well. Drug of choice has primarily been narcotics for probably the last decade. And as such, that baby can often come out with a depressed respiratory system in due in part to the fact that it has some type of a narcotic within its, its system. Hypothermia, Kira, will lead into respiratory problems as well. Newborns, remember we talked about the, the immature de development of the lungs that would come in into play there. Now, again, one of the reasons that we've talked about as far as hypothermia being a big, big issue here is, number one, they can't produce energy as efficiently as we can when we get older as adults. The other thing to remember is that their body surface area to their internal ability to manufacture and conserve heat is really, really off kilter. The body surface area to what they have internally is hugely disparate, okay? So uh, literally, as far as if we were to do a comparison of your body surface area to your internal organs, they would be much, much closer. With a child, it's mu or with a, a newborn, it's much more like this. And so the child is not able to maintain or to regulate its temperature. Most of the time, this will result in hypothermia rather in uh, hyperthermia. So the big thing that we got to do as soon as the kids are born is we got to get them dried off. If you'll think way back to your EMT lecture on trauma and environmental emergencies, one of the things that we talk about that speeds up heat loss is if we are wet. We know that, that you know, that's one of the reasons why people like to go to the water when it's hot. The water helps to cool them off. This is one of the reasons why in the winter, if you've got somebody in the backwoods, say that you're associated with Red Star or, or some other backwoods uh, rescue agency and they're wet, you got to get those wet clothes off and get them covered up with, with nice, warm, dry clothes. The other thing we've already talked about is make sure that you're putting a, a, a hat on them, all right? 
The ability of the babies to vasoconstrict and thus keep their body temp in closer to the core is severely restricted. That also leads to another big issue. This hypothermia can also begin to display itself in a decreased heart rate, decreased respiratory rate, as well as uh, hypoglycemia. Now, let's think about this uh, for just a minute. When we're seeing this decrease, it gets into a vicious cycle of where you don't have enough, but you're utilizing up more than what you are, what you have available. And so, John, that process accelerates. There's really not a lot you and I are going to be able to do for a newborn as far as if their blood sugars are low. Okay. I've never been able to get an IV started on a newborn. I did. I, I used to work in the ER down in Jellico years ago and just was, I, I'm not any good at it. And so as far as the amount of glucose that we would give the child, we're probably not going to do that. But what we do want to do is we want to address the things that we can, can fix. We want to try to keep them from becoming acidotic. We can do that by making sure we've got a good open airway, we're providing oxygen, and that we are keeping them warm. When we're looking at uh, addressing the management of a newborn, some of the things that we need to immediately ask is, first of all, does this baby have good muscle tone? How would we address that? Really, really simple. What do you think, Joe? How would we address whether muscle tone is good in the baby or if the baby is flaccid? Tell me more. You're on the right track. So how much at resistance and how would we determine that? What would we, what would we look for? So you could do that, but now remember babies, much like we touched a while ago, they don't really have that cognitive functioning of pushing back. I saw some other hands here. What, what can we do, Allie, to address muscle tone in the child? Yeah. So again, when a newborn is delivered and it's a good, healthy newborn, it should be doing two things. One of them is that it should be kicking its arms and legs. What should be the other one, Mark? All babies are born with a grasping reflex. Grasp your fingers. Now, that grasping reflex actually begins to develop at the time of birth. So they may not begin to, cover, to, to, to curve their fingers around really, really early. Again, probably at about 30 days, we would see that more so. So arms and leg movement and what else tells us uh, the other thing that we, we should be assessing right at the time of birth? Crying. Crying. Okay, crying means the baby's moving air, okay? If a baby is moving its arms and legs, if the baby is crying profusely, once we have cut the cord and we've taken care of protection of the end of the cord, both for mom, but particularly for the baby, now you can give the baby over to mom for skin-to-skin -skin contact, or if mom is going to breastfeed, let her start feeding the child right then, okay? Because the child is going to need the nourishment to help to increase the ability of the uh, of glucose to be produced and absorbed. Prior to that, make sure that you are drying the baby off. The drying serves two purposes. Number one is that it helps to take away the moisture that's on the skin, which reduces heat loss. The second thing that happens is the towel drying against the baby is actually irritating to the baby and we're going to make that baby cry more which is a good thing for us we want that crying to occur for a number of reasons number one it increases the gas exchange and number two it increases what other thing that we've already talked about what else increases with crying temperature not temperature 
getting the fluid out of the lungs. Good, Allie. So we get more of that fluid out of the lungs so that perfusion can continue to, to increase. Watch the observ or watch the breathing, the activity, and the skin color of your baby. Okay. We'll talk more about it in just a, a, a little while when we talk about deliveries, APGAR. APGAR score is something that has been around since the 1950s. Named for a physician by the name of Virginia APGAR. She took her last name, said, okay, we're going to address these things and we're going to evaluate them at one minute and at five minutes. I'm going to tell you guys that when you are assessing a premature field delivery, you're going to continue to assess the APGAR every five minutes till you get to the hospital, okay? And you turn that child over. We'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. If the child is not moving, if the child is not crying, if the child is not beginning to pink up, now that gives us a different direction that we're going to have to go. First thing is we're going to have to look and see, is our problem with body temp, okay? I know I keep repeating this, but understand... Again, it's not because I'm old and forgetful, but it's because that it's that important. So make sure the temp in the back of your truck is up. Make sure that the baby is wrapped up. Make sure that the baby is uh, is dry. If the baby's got a lot of secretions coming out of its mouth and nose, continue to suction. Don't use your suction unit. Use the bulb suction in your, uh, your OB kit. Why do we not use our section unit when we use it for everybody else? If we're concerned about the amount of oxygen they already have, we don't want to reduce how much they got going in. That's one thing. Remember, when we suction a person, it is going to pull some oxygen out of their lungs. With adults, we're not nearly as concerned about that because if you were to suction me, oral suction is happening up in here. My lungs are way down here. If you're dealing with, let's say, a newborn that is about that size, that distance has dropped dramatically, okay? What's the second reason? Think anatomy. John. How? You're on the right track. This is exactly where I want to go. It's more fragile. Why? Again, think anatomy. I'll give you a hint. Trachea. The trachea is pliable. Very pliable. Does the trachea of the newborn have cricoid rings around it? Not at all. Basically, it is a tube of flexible membrane. If we try to suction and we've got too much suctioning going on, we can take that trachea and we can do this to it. And if we if this happens, for the bonus question, what part of the trachea do you think this would happen at? Why? Yeah, it's an hourglass shape. So we're going to collapse the middle of it. So we're going to have no air that's going to come into play there. That can lead to paramedic-induced trauma, which can, number one, cause bleeding, number two, cause swelling, and because of that, it reduces the amount of air that is able to get into the lungs. As a result, we want to use the bulb suction because it is much, much lower. Ventilate and oxygenate your child, okay? Make sure that you're looking at that. If the heart rate drops, okay, heart rate Always, this is one of the things for a P patient, if the heart rate drops below 60, we're going to start compressions. We're just going to start compressions, regardless of what we see as far as any of the other areas. With this child, if they're in cardiac arrest, get a line started. Most likely it's going to be an IO. Come right to you, Allie, and give the patient uh, epinephrine. All right, Allie. With a premature baby, they're exactly right, okay? With a premature baby, we'll talk more about specific care of premature babies when we get into the delivery process. 
but I'm glad you brought that up. You're exactly right. So it is less than 100 in premature for a normal delivery or a child even going up into the toddler age, anything less than 60, not sufficient to provide circulatory status for the baby. Good job. Very, very good. Uh, when we're looking at this, again, look at the resp respirations. How are they? Are they adequate? Is it coming into play here, and is it doing well enough? Do you hear sounds? Do you hear snoring? Most of the time, you will not hear snoring in a newborn, okay? What you will hear is gurgling, okay? Which means we got to do what, ladies and gentlemen? Suction. we got to suction, all right? And we're going to... Stop right there.